For those who don't know me, my name is Patrick McCauley. As a member of the advisory committee of the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College, I would like to welcome, welcome you to tonight's Zoom event. A particularly warm welcome to the many who are here for the first time. The Institute for Religion and Science was established 12 years ago to promote the constructive engagement of religion spirituality with science and technology, and to encourage a dialogue that is interfaith, multi-science, and civil. To this end, we sponsor lectures, a reading circle, and other events. Do check our website for resources, particularly for past videos and for our blog. Also, be sure that you sign up for our mailing lists, which can help you stay up on all the new events that come through our program. I would also like to mention to, that tonight's lecture is the third in a three-part series. And the earlier lectures involving Philip Hefner and Noreen Hertzfeld will be available uh, for any who would like to see them. Finally, our, today will, our, our day will flow in the following way. First, Sister Kathy Duffy will introduce our speaker. After the lecture, we will move into breakout rooms for small group discussion. I would also like to remind you to write questions in the chat so that the speaker can respond to them in appropriate order. All right, Sister Kathy Duffy. Thank you, Patrick. So it's my pleasure this evening to introduce to you our speaker, uh, Dr. Anna For First, Forst. Dr. Forst holds a PhD in theology from the University of Bochum in Germany, as well as undergraduate degrees in philosophy and computer science. She's currently professor of computer science and the program chair, as well as director of the individualized major program at St. Bonaventure University in Olean, New York. During her time as a postdoctoral fellow at MIT in artificial intelligence and robotics, she served as the theological advisor for the COG and Kismet projects at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. These were among the very first hominoid projects in the world. So she really has been involved in this for a long, for a long time since its beginning, which isn't that long <laughs> compared to the length of the universe, but, uh, but certainly in, as far as AI goes. Uh, these, um, she has spoken extensively on artificial intelligence, computer science, and the concepts of personhood and dignity to academic audiences and to the media. As a robotics theologian, her work has captured much media attention. She is a contributing editor to Spirituality and Health and consults for the National Public Radio. She has also appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and Science. Anna continues to ask questions regarding religious and ethical issues involved in artificial intelligence and robotics, including hacking and cybernetics ethics. Her la latest book entitled Cybersecurity and Hacking Ethics was published last year. Although I met Anna some years ago at a conference where she demonstrated her work with COG, Michelle and I also had the wonderful opportunity to hear on it last June at a conference at Penn. So we knew then that we wanted Anna to come to be with us here at the Institute. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Anna Force to the Institute for Religion and Science. Thank you so much, Kathy. What a wonderful introduction. <laughs> I'm not muted, right? You yes. can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, right? Okay, then let me share my screen and let's start Let's start the slideshow. So um, my question that I'm going to try to ask today is can AI systems be persons? And um, in order for, doing, for answering that question, we have to first ask, what is AI? Um, so one, one definition of AI, which is very common among AI researchers is when it works, it's not AI. Um, <laughs> 
because uh, because uh, 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 there is really no fully functional AI around. Um, we see that later with ChatGPT. But the the more serious definition is that artificial intelligence is the attempt to let a computer do things for which we intuitively believe intelligence is necessary. That is a very vague uh, definition, but the best there is. And what is interesting is that there are two different camps in AI and two different paradigms how to achieve letting a computer do something for which we intuit that intelligence is necessary. The first approach is with big data. Um, a computer can go th way through tons and tons and tons of data in a very short amount of time. This is how computers are able to play chess. And this is also how we came about to have ChatGPT and the newest GPT-4 um, uh, uh, that are language, natural language models that can interact with you in a very natural way, can produce language, can generate language, can generate essays, can generate poetry. I had ChatGPT today in, uh, uh, write, write a poem about death. It wasn't a very good poem, but, it, but nonetheless. And... Um, so this is the first approach to artificial intelligence, which is big data. The second approach to artificial intelligence is um, social intelligence. Here we have autonomous robots that through actuators and sensors interact with the real world. And uh, what I try to convince you of today is that those social ro robots might become persons at some point while big data never will. Because what we have here is two different kinds of understandings of humankind. With big data, our understanding of humankind is that humans are all thought and data retrieval. With social intelligence robots, with autonomous robots, we believe that human beings, that the intelligence of human beings is to survive. And that, I believe, is the more appropriate understanding of humans. So before we go into it, let's just talk about how we actually treat artificial intelligence. And the first thing is that is that we actually anthropomorphize AI because we anthropomorphize everything. We, for instance, anthropomorphize God. We have metaphors like shepherd, king, judge. God holds us on her breast. God holds us under her wings. Those are metaphors from the Psalms. So we anthropomorphize God because we cannot understand God without anthropomorphizing. Children anthropomorphize everything because that is what we are trained to do from birth on everything we interact with at the beginning is human. So anthropomorphizing is natural, it's automatic, and it's easy. Um, and most AI seduces actually people to anthropomorphize. So for instance, there's this beautiful experiment that they did where they put eight people and uh, uh, 16 people and 16 screens in one room. Eight people were blue, wore blue arm badges, eight people wore green arm badges, eight monitors were blue, eight monitors were green. And they played interactive games. And after a while, the people who, were, who wore blue, blue arm badges felt more solidarity with the computers with the blue screens than with the humans than with the green screens. So there's definitely an anthropomorphizing going on. My actually favorite experiment was where they, where they invited people to judge a teaching program. The teaching program was deliberately really bad. And so they they first tested the program and then the computer on which they had tested the program would do an evaluation. How was my program? How what did it go? And the people were all positive. Then they were led into a different room and asked by a different, do an evaluation with a different computer. How was that computer? How was the learning program? They were still fairly positive, but slightly more negative. And then a person with a pen and paper asked them, so how was that robot's performance and this computer's performance? And everyone said, oh my God, this is such a lousy program. Um, so without noticing it, they had first didn't want to hurt the computer's feelings. And then they even assumed some sort of solidarity between the first computer and the second computer. In other words, we anthropomorphize and we anthropomorphize computers. Mm -hmm. So what do we have as AI today? Most, most famous are ChatGPT and just last week GPT-4 came out, um, which, is, which is advanced to ChatGPT. 
um, those gener those those generate um, sentences and um, you can interact with them. It's quite remarkable in higher ed and in education in general. We are quite afraid of ChatGPT because it allows cheating because it can write essays very well. Um, but both have no real intelligence. What they have is the knowledge of the web and they simulate intelligence and they depend on our tendency to anthropomorphize. And despite many discussions, there is really no attempt to assign them personhood or dignity yet. So when would AI be a person? Well, First of all, it would need general intelligence. Now, ChatGPT and GPT-4 have general intelligence. What do I mean with general intelligence? It means that those people are not um, are not uh, that those computers are not specialized in one specific area. Take a chess computer. We believe that a chess computer is smart with regarding to chess, but you cannot talk with a chess computer about poetry. That would require general intelligence. So we would assign AI personhood when it had general intelligence, when it had some sort of self-awareness, when it was autonomous, so it created reactions and reactions autonomously, and if it could interact with natural environment. In other words, such an AI would have to be created in our image. It would have to have human-like intelligence. It would have natural interactions with us and would make us empathetic without cheating. In other words, the anthropomorphization would be much more justified than it is than with ChatGPT. And so the question is, are there machines like this outside of sci-fi? And the clear answer is no. There aren't such machines at, at outside of sci-fi. However, we have to be honest, that is not yet. We might eventually reach that point. But I think what is more crucial, again, when we go back to this list of, intel of, of, of uh, conditions that would uh, AI have to be fulfilled in order to be called a person, we have to say that there are all quite a bit of humankind who don't fulfill this criteria. There are people who don't have general intelligence. Um, there are people who cannot interact with other human beings. There are people who cannot um, interact with their environments. In other words, those conditions are tricky if we want to assign all humans personhood, then we cannot use such conditions. So let's just talk about humans for a second. The most important thing about humans is that we are embodied. And that expresses itself in several ways. First of all, emotions are a prerequisite for conditions. Uh, rational thought cannot happen if we don't have emotions. And if our emotional system is, is in some way harmed, uh, we process emotions in the frontal lobes of our, of our brain. And when the frontal lobes are damaged, people also can, cannot make rational decisions anymore. So that's a very interesting thing. Cognition depends on bodily reality. I think differently from my cat because my cat walks on four on four, four legs while I'll walk on two. Um, I'm a carnivore. Uh, I'm an omnivore. My cat is a carnivore. So we have just from our bodily reality, we have different perspectives and therefore different kinds of cognition. From developmental psychology, we know that we actually build our memory not inside of our brain. That's an assumption that, that is wrong. A lot of people say, use computer metaphors such as I couldn't store it or I couldn't process it um, to explain memory. While in fact, we build memory out in the outside world, a, a, a term that de de developmental psychologists called external scaffolding. And cognition is fundamentally based on brain architecture. Um, our brain architecture leads us to the thoughts we have. And there is just one little very interesting tidbit that religiosity has a neurological equivalent, something that the media have dubbed God module. Um, it's between the frontal lobes and the neocortex in the right hemisphere. This area of the brain is active when people report a religious experience. And when you stimulate that area in the brain, 
people then explore, uh, uh, um, um, say they had a religious experience. Now, the question is, of course, does that God module mean in any way, shape or form, does it say anything about if God, if there is a God or not? And the answer is, is, is of course not. Because you can either argue, oh, religiosity is just in the brain, which is what a lot of people did when it was first discovered. But the discoverers of that God module actually said, no, in fact, fact, God has built that module into us in order to communicate with us. So in other words, we think because our brain has the architecture that it has, and that means everything has a neural substrate. And so our religiosity also has a neural substrate that does not say anything about if there is a God or not. Now, what we get through this importance of a body is a new understanding of intelligence. We know that intelligence cannot be abstracted from the body. And we know because our body has evolved over evolution that we are driven by very basic uh, by very basic drives. So the standard four drives are called the four Fs, which is feeding, fleeing, fighting, and procreation. Those are the four Fs, and those are the four main drives that we have. And our intelligence helps us to survive. It is a byproduct of evolution, and here's especially feminists who understand this um, understanding of intelligence very well and see chess and mathematical theory improving and our abstract thought as byproduct of our capability to survive. So now that we got our embodiment out of the way, let's start a first approach with personhood. What does it mean to be a person? Well, first of all, being alive is not a condition for personhood because uh, first of all, there's a lot of other animals, other animals than the human animal that we treat really not like persons. Um, uh, secondly, uh, being human is not a, a definition for personhood because while we use human and person synonymous um we don't think that way because if we really would treat all human beings as persons genocide racism and prejudice would not happen so in a form of genocide we deny the persons the people the humans who are victims of the genocide we deny them personhood when we are racist, we deny the person against whom we have racist thought, we deny them personhood because we see them as a lesser human. When we are prejudiced, we deny the people pre the people we are prejudiced against personhood because we, we see them only as that against which we have a prejudice. So in other words, when we look at this approach to personhood, there are no empirical criteria for personhood, because whenever we come up with a criterion for personhood um, that we say, OK, a, a, a being would have to be that and would have to have that, then uh, we exclude automatically human beings from the family of persons. And from a theological perspective, we can't do that. So I have, I'm here suddenly in a paradox. So I want to assign from a theological point of view, each human being, the asset of person, but I cannot really define personhood empirically. So the question is, how can I define personhood? Well, um, we humans have actually a big trouble with that. We actually are very, very exclusive beings. Um, we have babies have already a language and face preference between six and nine months. So in other words, with six months, a baby babbles all sorts of sounds. With nine months, it babbles in the sounds of, its, of, its, of the language it's surrounded by, what will become its mother tongue. Uh, babies with six months can distinguish between a lot of different faces. Babies with nine months can are much better in facial recognition, but only from people they know. So for instance, when I never see a person with glasses until I'm about six years old, I have trouble distinguishing people with glasses. A little more sinister, if I've never seen an Asian face and I suddenly with eight, nine years old detect Asian faces for the first time, I have, I have trouble actually di differentiating between those faces. This mechanism 
called leads to what is called, what is generally referred to as the Dunbar number. At any given moment, I have only the capability to have approximately 150 beings in the group that I assign personhood to, 150. That's pretty much the limit. And the way we know about this number is that both in the military as well in the church, um, groups fell apart when they had more than 150 members. So, uh, which is why religious communities usually have about 150 members that are there at one point, and so do um, so do military units. We humans distinguish st distinguish very strictly between our insider group, people we are accept that are part of our group, and outsiders. And we have a wish for familiarity. Um, statistically significant uh, people marry when their name starts with the same letter. Um, they did this experiment with T preferences. Tommy wanted to me, Valora wanted Lawler. So in other words, both wanted T kinds that sounded like their first name. And how do we justify our biological being that we are exclusive? We justify it with superiority myth. Oh, people with glasses are inferior because I cannot distinguish them, their faces. People outside my group of 150 are not as good as I am. So for instance, um, let me give you an, let me give you a couple of examples for Dunbar numbers. Let, oops, let me show you here some videos. This is people who were sent on campus um, as an experiment to actually um, ask someone for a direction and I let you see what happens. And if you believe that that was a coincidence, that the professorial type who gave directions didn't recognize um, that, that someone else was actually popping behind the door, that the person who we gave directions to was entirely different, let me show you the other one. So um, it's kind of amazing, right? But that is due to the professorial type meets thousands of students every day. They don't see the individuals as persons. They become persons when they're in the classroom, but outside of campus, they don't. The lady in the white shirt doesn't see a worker as a person at this moment because she knows she will never see him again. So why should she recognize when, when, when they are shifting? So we think that we would be better than that. I bet that all of you right now think, oh, that would never happen to me. Well, in fact, it would. Uh, because that has to do with the Dunbar number. So I always love this example because it's such a beautiful, um, beautiful um, uh, um, visualization of the Dunbar number. Now, there is something else that we often use as criterion for personhood, and that is self-awareness. Um, self-awareness, the best test for self-awareness is the famous Sally and Anne test. So what you see are two girls, Sally, who has a basket in front of her, and Anne, who has a box. And Sally has a ball and puts that in her basket and leaves the room. Now Anne takes the ball from Sally's basket and puts it in her box. And the question is, where will Sally look for her ball when she comes back to the room? Now we all know Sally will look in the basket because she was absent when Anne put the, uh, put the ball from the basket into the box. But babies under 36 months month of age, so under three, three years of age, will invariably point to the box. They have seen that Anne moved the basket. They have moved the ball. They have no understanding that anyone else has a different perspective from them. They have no sense of self and therefore no sense of other. So they will point invariably to the box. Between 36 and 45 months of age, uh, you have a mixed face where you actually, where, where the children will look to the one and point to the other. 
And then with 45 months of age, they will definitely pass that test. So they will look always to the basket because that is where Sally left the ball. So what you have here is a self-other ambiguity. So self-awareness cannot be a criterion for personhood unless we want to deny humans under age of 45 month personhood. And I think no one is ready to do that. Now, here's the interesting thing. ChatGPT passes the test. But ChatGPT doesn't pass the test because it actually has an understanding of otherness. ChatGPT passes it because there are myriad cases of Sally N and Sally of the Sally N example online. And because it, it searches the web constantly and knows what's on the web, it will give the right answer, not because it actually understands that it is the right answer, but because it knows the example. Leonardo is a humanoid robot, and that actually did pass the text test through embodied interaction. So that was interesting. Leonardo is unfortunately in a museum um, since uh, since 9-11. Uh, a lot of funding for humanoid robot projects has gone down because the military seeks to get real autonomous, sold, autonomous robots as soldiers. And so we had to work application-based and that led those projects like Cog Kismet and Leonardo unfortunately behind. So, however, we are talking about Christianity. And Christianity transcends biology. So far, I've been talking about biology, about developmental psychology, about human beings, about human beings from an evolutionary perspective. Now we talk about Christianity. And first of all, Christianity is pretty much the most inclusive religion on the planet because our founder, Jesus, was never a Christian. Usually when you have a religious founder, they convert to the religion they start. Jesus was never a Christian. He was a Jew. He lived as he was born as a Jew. He lived as a Jew. He died as a Jew. And he was resurrected still as a Jew. So Jesus was never a Christian. Our Bible is in most part the Jewish Bible. And all early theology was actually Jewish. Paul, Peter, Mary of Magdala, Mark, Luke, John, to mention the most important theologians of the early time, they were all Jews. And Jesus wants us to be all inclusive, and that is best demonstrated in the Sermon of the Mount. Now, you all know chapter 15, the chapter 5 of the Sermon of the Mount, where Jesus says we are all murderers and cheaters. Whoever looked at someone with rage has already murdered them, and whoever looked with someone with desire has already cheated with them. Um, so what does that mean? I mean, there are lots of different interpretive ways, but when you come from the perspective of Jesus being all inclusive, then what it means is we shouldn't look down on murderers and cheaters because we could do the same. We are capable of everything that other human beings are capable of, and therefore we should not construct insiders and outsiders. And that is best, um, best expressed in the commandment, uh, love your enemies. Um, so Jesus does not only say, love your neighbors, no, love your enemies. And this the love here is not just a, you know, not, not, not a warm, cozy feeling. The love here is agape or agape, however it is pronounced. Um, it is empathy, the capability to put yourself into someone else's shoes. And what Jesus does with us in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus wants us to try to have empathy with every human being, no matter who they are, no matter what they do. Um, this is closely related to the Imago Dei. The Imago Dei, the image of God, that humans are created in the image of God. The Hebrew term for image is actually Salem, which means literally a divine clay statue. So what it means, we are all statues of God. And when you put that together with the first commandment, which is you shall not make an image, right? What that means, we shall not adore statues of God. Rather, when we want to adore God, we should look at each other because every one of us is a divine statue. And the Bible is pretty clear. Both male and female are divine statues, right? Um, so there is no distinction that only a small group of human beings are, are, are divine statue. Every human being, no matter what, is a divine statue. So the Imago Dei is a relational concept. God has chosen us as partners, and that is actually interesting because in the creation story, in the first creation story in Genesis 1, um, after each act of creation, there is a key tough and it was good. 
after the creation of humans, there is no Kitav. And in the in the in the in the, in, in Jewish mysticism, this is usually interpreted as humans are not good. They are part of something very good, but they are not themselves good. So let's just think about that anymore. Part of it is because we are so exclusive. We are not good. But it's also that we are nothing special. Humans depend on God-given food like all other animals. Humans have to die like all other animals. So the only reason that gives us specialness, the only reason why we are special is because God has chosen us. It is not because of empirical qualities. When we now go back to our social robots, what we will recognize is that robots have these robots have been built in our image. They are not capable very well of abstraction, but they are very good at survival. And survival is actually much, much harder to build than abstraction. Uh, Deep Blue beat the, the then reigning world champion in chess, Gary Kasparov, in, 19, in 1997. But it took us until 2005 to create a robot that actually is able to put butter on a piece of bread. If that sounds astonishing, is because we learn to put butter on a piece of bread from the time we are infants. Uh, but when you think about it, it's actually really hard. First of all, you have to coordinate your hand that holds the knife with a hand that holds the bread. Then you have to kind of dig your hand into your knife into the butter. Then you have to sense how hard the butter is. And then you have to put it exactly with enough pressure so that it spreads, but not with too much pressure so that the bread will be falling apart. So it actually takes enormous intelligence to put butter on a piece of bread. And again, the only reason why we don't think it requires a lot of intelligence is because we are able to do it from so early on while we think chess is really, really hard. Chess is easy to program. Um, so in other words, autonomous robots are much harder to build than chat, GPT, or chess. They are embedded in the world through a lot of sensors, and they actually share social signals. They share attention. So when one someone looks at something, another one does. They do turn-taking, so they actually interact with one another. They do voice melodies, so they react to prohibition. No, you don't do that. They react to command, do that, and not that. They react to invitation, shall we go for a walk? And they respond to soothing, good boy, good boy. Those are the four voice melodies that every, that every mammal understands. And so those are the four voice melodies that actually robots can understand. They have facial expressions and they make eye contact. I want to demonstrate you two examples. The first one is Paro. Para is a, is a therapeutic robot that is used in elderly care facilities. It's very cute, as you can see. What it does, it babbles, it makes cute little sounds, and it reacts to stroking by cuddling against the hand that strokes it. It cuddles against the body. It is warm. It gives kisses. It's just very adorable. And um, what is actually interesting is that power reduces stash, stress in patients and caregivers, and it motivates patients more to interact with one another, which is actually quite interesting. So people, people, patients who interact with L, with Paro are more willing to interact with other social beings, and it proves socialization as especially in people with dementia. So the, 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 the people with dementia improve a lot when they interact with Paro. And of course, it's easier and cheaper than pets. Now, a society, of course, has to ask itself, here's the, here speaks the ethicist, if we really want to have robots taking care of the elderly. But since right now, a lot of people in elderly care facilities are very alone, I much rather they have Paro than no one. Another robot I would like to demonstrate is Kismet. I like your Kismet. You're a pretty funny person. Now, you now, just so that you know, Kismet just babbles. Rich, the guy, his name is Rich, he actually talks and sends us, but Kismet just babbles. Kismet just makes sound. Do you laugh at all? I laugh a lot. Carol says I laugh a lot. I try not to laugh at her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
See how it makes eye contact? It follows him with his eye. Dude, I want to show you something. This is, this is a watch that my this is a watch that my girlfriend gave me. Oh hell! Yeah, look, it's got this is uh, this is shared attention where Kismet actually shares the attention. It looks with rich points. Let's see that again. Oh, my. This is a watch that my girlfriend gave me. Oh hell! Yeah, look, it's got a little blue light in it too. You're like, I almost lost it this week. <laughs> <laughs> how, how you, you know what it's like to lose something? I'm gonna try closing my eyes. Let me try opening my eyes. No, stop. No, no, no. I, I gotta talk now. No, no, stop. Listen to me. Listen to me. I think we have something going on. Oh, I think there's something here between us. Stop. You gotta let me talk. Stop. Shh, 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 shh. I think we got something going on here. You and me. You're amazing. What are you? Hang on a second. I still want to talk to you. I had a couple more things I want to say. <laughs> so this is Kismet, a very impressive robot. Let me just go back to my slides. So what is my conclusion? After I showed you these autonomous robots, intelligence is embodied. And personhood is cultural. We assign personhood to those beings who are like us. And theological, it's an assignment to us from God. As soon as we use empirical criteria to define personhood, it becomes it's, we, we exclude human beings from the community of persons. But when we assign personhood as acceptance by God, it becomes inclusive. But if that's the case, then there is really no reason why robots could not become persons as well, because robots, as soon as they are part of the human community, would become part of, God, of God's community as well. And um, the success of social robots and the failure of expert systems like ChatGPT, who aren't really smart, shows the importance of embodiment. And what I like especially about that is that AI, in its success of autonomous robots and the rejection of disembodied AI, arrives there where the Bible has started all along. Because remember, we have an embodied resurrection and we have no body-soul split that's alien to the Bible. So in other words, AI teaches us something about what it means to be human because whatever works is actually the way that AI, that whatever succeeds in AI tells us something about how we are and uh, something that a lot of people might find surprising, but which is actually true, AI makes us humble because it is so, so very hard even to program a robot to put butter on a piece of bread. It's hard to build an ant. So in the way, AI also shows us how wonderful we are created. And with this beautiful quote from Psalm 139, I leave you. I'm gonna, gonna thank Anna for a beautiful talk. Wonderful. And I'm going to send us all into breakout rooms to talk about this. <laughs> and all right, I'm, well, I'm gonna welcome everyone back. And again, thank um, Anna for a wonderful and really thought provoking talk. And if people have questions, now's your moment to put them in the chat. And maybe I'll get us I'll get us started. Um, so you look at these, you know, robots that are used to care for the elderly. And you had a moment where you said the ethicist in you, you know, worries about these a little bit. Could you expand a bit on that? Well, thank you. Yes. Um the 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 thing is that I'm worried that we basically give over the care of the elderly to robots because um japan i mean 
all Western, all so-called Western, all industrialized nations are currently overaging. So we have a continuously aging population. So the percentage of elderly people is much higher than younger people. And it's getting only worse with life with life expectancy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, so Japan, we, the US and also my home country, Germany, they've solved that problem through immigration, right? By immigrating, by letting a lot of younger people in, we basically make artificially the population younger, which is great. Um, Japan doesn't do that because Japan is a very exclusive society. And so um, uh, uh, they plan to actually have all elderly care done by robots. And mm -hmm. I find that sad because the society has to ask itself to what extent does it value the elderly? And so when we use Paro, which was also developed in Japan, I mean, I think it's great because the elderly folks are much happier with Paro. So that is all for the good. But at the same time, isn't that sad that we don't have enough human beings who take care of the elderly? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and it's about relationship, you know, can the, yeah. can the, can the robot be re relating in the same way? So well, since we are up, up, since we are anthropomorphizing, yes, it can, right? Yeah, yeah. This is this is true. I mean, we anthropomorphize so much without even realizing it that it's um, you have to really step back to think to think about it. Yeah. So we have some questions in the chat, and the first one is: Does AI relate to transhumanism, ultrahumanism, and if yes, how? Such a good question. Um, so uh, the 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 um, embodied AI is absolutely diametrically opposed to transhumanism, um, because we believe that intelligence is 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 embedded, it's is 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 embodied and embedded in the world. So the whole idea of downloading the brain and having it run on a different hardware is just completely inconceivable, because the body is the key of intelligence. Um, but with ChatGPT and other technologies. Yes, they absolutely believe that the that whatever intelligent substrate is running on the hardware can be downloaded onto a different machine. The classical example is that a version of ChatGPT is now serving Bing, the search engine of of Microsoft. Um, so so yes, uh, that absolutely that absolute is a connection. So in other words, it depends on what understanding of intelligence and what understanding of human intelligence you have. If it is embodied, then transhumanism is out. If you believe it's abstracted, it has nothing to do with the body, then transhumanism is in. Yeah. Um, could AI be considered persons as beings to which we owe care? Do we have a responsibility to AI as persons? Again, I would argue not yet. Um, and certainly never to intelligences like ChatGPT because they are just too abstract. And, um, you know, to give you an example, uh, I mean, they put explicit programming on top of ChatGPT so that it wouldn't be racist, but it doesn't distinguish between good and bad information on the web, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. have any filters that we automatically develop because we are embodied. So no, I don't think those are the technologies we have responsibility for. But when we have actually autonomous robots that interact with us on a level that we assign them personhood, then yes, we would have to ask ourselves how we treat these products of our geniuses, right? And uh, mm -hmm. that is the moment where responsibility certainly comes in. Right. What, what was the little robot that was moving from Boston around the country and people were supposed to take it places and it came to Philadelphia and people destroyed it? Destroyed it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which, which we did not have a responsibility. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, who is controlling the moral and ethical issues in AI development? And is AI contributing to humanity's technological trance? Technological what? Technological trance. What is that? What is uh, trends? Uh, trends. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Um. So, so who's controlling the ethical and moral one? Well, what is actually kind of interesting is that OpenAI, the company that developed ChatGPT, has some very strict and rigid ethical guidelines, which I think is kind of cool. So they, for instance, say that the technology should never be used to enrich people. 
um, which is great. Um, that technology should never be used to um, to 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 create a, a insiders and outsiders. Um, so they have some very rigid rules. But that is, of course, we all know that that's not necessarily normal. Um, I do think who ultimately controls this is all of us. I mean, of course, there are researchers like me who specialize in it, but uh, there are also, I think, ultimately, the whole public has to educate itself and therefore has to take the moral and ethical responsibility, because we have to make sure that we stand up against technologies that are not in our best interest and fight those and have to create a public dialogue. Um, if we just put our hand in the sand and don't want to have anything to do with those technologies, that's not the right that's not the right um, uh, way of going, of doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we all have a responsibility to think about these things. But yes. I think, yes, and, um, but I think people sometimes want to, you know, defer to either the technology or to the ethics without, you know, having their own kind of sense of what does this mean? Um, another question, can we have a relationship with a robot? I seem to have a relationship with my car. I talk to her. She has a name. Um, I've assigned her a gender. Um, and so might AI robots have a role in medical care that includes relationship? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I, I, I mean, again, because of our universal sense of anthropomorphizing, we definitely can have a relationship with a robot. The question is, can the robot have a relationship back? Mm. And we are currently not there yet. Um, so, uh, 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 we, we, we currently, currently, for instance, kismet as smart as kismet is, it cannot distinguish between different human beings. It doesn't have personal oh. relationships. So it doesn't know who is actually talking to it. It knows, it doesn't know that is rich and that's Cynthia and that's Anna who are talking to it. So I think that would have to be established that the robot can actually distinguish between different people and have different relationships with them. That would be a condition for actually the robot having a relationship with us. Yeah. What else would be a condition for having relationship? I mean, that it I really, uh, Chris may have not particularly thought about what does it mean for a robot to have a relationship with me? That means that uh, somehow I'm different from the next person that comes up and asks it's a, a question. Are there other things that we should think about when we think about what it means to have a relationship with a, or for the robot to have a relationship with us? Well, again, I'm thinking about the not conscious three-year-old, right? Yeah. And I think that is the relationship that the not conscious three-year-old has with us. It can distinguish between, she or he can distinguish between different people, has different relationships with different people, but it's not aware of it. Right. So different reactions and different behaviors with different people. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So that might be a that might be a way to to think about it. Is humanity's obsession with AI um does it have the unconscious goal of creating an all-knowing parent, a god substitute to make all our decisions? That's an interesting question. Again, when it comes to when it comes to um, um, abstract AI, the the the, the knowledge based AI, um, I would argue there is certainly a certain god complex there. Um, uh, that, but when it comes to autonomous robots, I don't think we are seeking to build something that is better than us. I mean, first of all, we are desperately trying to build something that is as good as, a, as good as I mentioned the ant before, I was not kidding, is as good as interacting with the world as an ant is. So, um, so I don't think, I don't think that that is necessarily motivation. It really depends on what camp of AI you are in. And I'm 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 very I'm I'm very clear about that. You have to distinguish those two camps because the motivations in both are different. The technology in both is different. The way what the AIs can do is different. So you have to distinguish that. Right. I'm thinking about sort of you know the uh, exhaustion of decision making. Can one offload something like that to AI? That's different from being a god substitute. So I'm thinking about you know every week I have to figure out what we're going to have for dinner for seven nights and um, I'm happy to outsource that with, you know, within some reason. But isn't that cool? I mean, the whole idea yeah. of a smart fridge from of a smart fridge. I'm at I'm at my work, and I can exactly know what I have in the fridge. Go and buy something, and my my fridge tells me what to make for dinner. I mean, that's perfect. 
Right. So yeah, I think a lot of yeah, a lot of trivial decisions will actually be given to AI, and I think that's all good. Yeah, no, I'm I am I'm trying to now come up with a list of things I could get, you know, AI to do for me and take some of that decision out of my out of my hands. Um, unless AI develops consciousness, would that not make treatment of it moot? It doesn't have consciousness yet, so we don't need to worry about it, I think might be the subtext to that but, question. But again, I would argue that children don't have consciousness, right? And so uh, children under the age of, 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 of 40 months don't have self-awareness. So I would have a really hard time with not assigning them, them them personhood. And I would have a really hard time, even though they don't have moral agency, to not treat them with moral agency. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, 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 again, this is consciousness is one of these empirical criteria that we use um, to say, oh yeah, a person would have to have consciousness and we automatically exclude other human beings, which I, from a theological perspective, perspective can't do. And I'm not using only children as examples. Someone who is severely dement also doesn't have consciousness anymore. And, mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, can we, can we, do we stop assigning them personhood? And again, I would argue, no, we assign yeah, that I personhood. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that, that, you know, you can be, I mean, even someone who's completely unconscious, for example, in the middle of surgery is also not a conscious person, yet we still assign them personhood Person, as well. Yes. And um, do we have any more questions? We have a comment that says, yes, children do have consciousness, um, but not below a certain age is what I'm hearing. Well, again, the Sally and N test is the universally recognized test for self-awareness. Okay. Yep. So if you, if you base it on that, if uh, I base it on that, then, then no, they don't have self-awareness. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm looking to see if we have any more questions in the chat. And it looks like we don't, but I want to say thank you for both a really fascinating presentation and thought provoking and I'm really appreciating the notion that we should be thinking ahead about these things. Yes. Right. Right. That, you know, we don't want to be thinking all of a sudden we have a conscious um, autonomous robot. And now we're worried about what the ethical problems are. Right. Um, yes. Ethical questions are. Um, so thank you. So thank you so much for that. And I will turn it back to Kathy. And so Anna, wonderful. Really appreciate your coming tonight. I wish you could come in person and I wish the audience could have come in person too. But that would be a better relationship, you know, because I it think would be embodied. So. <laughs> but if not, this is this is fine too. So I think that that's been it's been wonderful. It's been a wonderful series. I think that it's, there's been so so much diversity, you know, different ways of thinking of this uh, these questions. And as you said. And as I realize, we really have to be on top of this. So we can't just shy away and say, oh, I don't believe in that stuff or, you know, whatever. <laughs> or I'm afraid of it or whatever. It's really important for us all to, get, to learn something about, you know, what's happening so we can, uh, we can somehow uh, direct the, the future of our world. And so, Anna, thank you again very much. And uh, we hope. Thanks so much for having me. That was fun. Uh, good. We enjoyed it too. So. Yeah.